starting. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Technocrime Fighters Forum on number 60. This is the 10th of May, 2018. I'm Ramola D. I'm here this morning with Dr. Catherine Horton, um, Oxford and CERN physicist, and with NSA whistleblower Karen Mountain Stewart. Um, and we're here, as always, to have our morning conversation on Thursday mornings. Um, just about the state of surveillance in this country, in the US here today, as well as in Europe, in various countries in Europe, uh, to talk about the use of anti-personnel electromagnetic technologies and newer technologies wrongfully, illegitimately um, on people, on civilians, and most usually on civilians who are absolutely innocent and have done nothing to deserve being surveilled, monitored, or put on watch lists. Something that we have uh, written about, spoken about, analyzed uh, over and over several times. Uh, Karen has some wonderful flyers that I've put on my website, the Everyday Concerned Citizen under Flyers for Public Education. Please go there and check it out and find out what exactly the FBI and DHS are doing, why exactly these terrorist watch lists are a huge scam, and um, the grief that they have unleashed on our populations, uh, definitely in the US, but also in Canada and Mexico and, and you know, literally all over the world, every country in Europe as well, most definitely the UK and uh, Switzerland where Catherine is. So we just wanted to say hello and um, you know, we are sorry we're late this morning. Once again, we've had um, a major war room discussion, as Catherine calls it. Uh, we've been trying to catch up on each of our different cases, and we'll talk about each of our different stories a little bit today. So at this point, let me turn over the floor to, to either Catherine or Karen, whoever wants to um, open the floor. So well, I... Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I wanted to say, please, let's start with Karen today, because okay. I'm just <laughs> uploading a document in the background for later. Okay, because I think mine's going to be shorter. Um, this is an update on my EEOC case, which EEOC is Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So as people probably know, um, I was fired uh, by NSA two years short of my 30 years uh, career. And uh, they tried to cheat me out of my entire uh retirement, though I did fight them and get a partial retirement. But uh, I filed an EEO see a uh, complaint and uh, NSA being dishonest as they are uh, basically sat on my EEO complaint for I think the 90 days they had to investigate it and did nothing. That was in 2009 and uh, the judge said where's the uh, investigation they said well we got busy and forgot so we we're going to dismiss it anyway so why don't, we, why don't we just say let's dismiss it and he said no investigate you get another 90 days and which he shouldn't have done but he was uh not particularly brave um so anyway they investigate and that what they did with my complaint which was to say that um i was fired for being falsely accused of having a mental illness which i never had didn't have never had had and still do not have um and so that was a form of discrimination so instead of investigating based on what I said, and that was the first and major reason they discriminated, the second uh, major reason was that I was an older woman. You know, why give an older woman credit for her own work and a promotion for her work when you can give it to a young uh, office slut, which is what they decided to do. Um, and that's why they were mad that I went to the inspector general about it. So anyway, they... Um, decided to not investigate on what I complained about, but uh, NSA changed my reasons for um, uh, complaining to, oh, she thinks she was discriminated against because she's white. And my lawyer took one look at that and said, are you crazy? She never said that. So they said, they, they outlined to NSA, they said, this is why she's complaining. And, you, and she never said anything about being white, you know, and they said, oh, close enough. That's what we're going to investigate. So, of course, they did a, an investigation and found out, oddly enough, that no, I wasn't dis discriminated against by white people for being white. Okay? So that was utter bunk. So NSA said, oh, we'll find no problem here. Please just go ahead and dis dismiss the EEO uh, complaint. And at that point, the judge showed a little tiny bit of courage and said, no, that's ridiculous. I'm going to accept the case, and it's going to go on the queue uh, to wait for a time when we can have a hearing. So that was January 2010, 
and the case sat in the queue for eight years, uh, about eight years, which is, I think, extraordinarily long. Um, but anyway, last fall, he finally took the case off the shelf. It may have to do with the fact that uh, there was a newspaper article, I believe. Um, oh, I've forgotten the place. Uh, oh, the Daily Beast, talking about um, five whistleblower lawsuits, four of which had been completely um, found in favor of the government, despite uh, strong evidence against the government. And they said, uh, you know, the article is basically saying you can't win, you know, because it's there's such total bias. And they said there is one whistleblower lawsuit still on the books. It was from 2010 and it hasn't been decided yet. And I said, oh, my goodness, that's mine. So I sent that article to my lawyer and I said, you know, use this as leverage if you have to. So the judge um, sent out a decision a couple weeks ago saying, well, um, I looked at the case and Mrs. Stewart uh, um, claimed that NSA security had been stalking and harassing her illegally because of her inspector general complaint. So she failed to prove who these people were. So I'm just going to side with the NSA psychiatrist or the psychologist, actually, who said, no, this is just illusion. I'm going to side with her because Mrs. Stewart didn't provide any type of um, evidence that she's mentally healthy, both of which were outrageous lies. Okay, so my lawyer sent this decision and she said without my prompting, she said, I would strongly advise that you appeal this because he's making his decision based on non facts, which is a lawyer's nice way of saying he's lying. Uh, number one, when I went to the Howard County Police Department um, and I had images, car license, car licenses, makes and models of the cars that these stalkers were using. Uh, they started an investigation, and NSA shut them down. They said, you are not allowed to take any kind of police report for Mrs. Stewart, and you are not allowed to give her the names of any NSA personnel. You're not allowed to identify them to her, which, in my mind, is an admission that these people were NSA personnel. So NSA obstructed justice, they told the Howard County Police that they had the ability and the right to terminate my civil and constitutional rights and forbid them, uh, forbid them to me. So they obstructed justice, but I'm getting blamed because I didn't prove who these people were. Yet I have witnesses who said I saw these people on NSA property. Okay, so he totally dismissed that, um, and he said, "Oh well, maybe she could have just gone into the database and." gotten the information on these people herself. And I told my lawyer, I said, that's a really good way to go to prison. Okay, because if you go in and you get names of people at NSA and go to the police with those names, you'll go to prison. If you get license plates and things like that and saying, these are stalkers, identify them to me and then find out, are they NSA employees? That's the way to do it. But NSA shut that down. OK. And the second complaint that the judge fabricated was that, oh, I don't have any evidence in this uh, entire case that the, that uh, Mrs. Stewart is mentally sound. So I just have to assume that the NSA psychologist was right and she just was deluded thinking these people were following her. Well, there's the um, the psychological evaluation I took in 1982 when I um, applied for the job at NSA that I passed. And there is the. Um, five-year reevaluation of a lot of things, one of which being a psychological evaluation. So that would have been four or maybe five that I passed um, while NSA, and those are sent out and independently graded. So five to six independently graded tests say there's nothing wrong with me. Okay, so there was that evidence that we supplied them, and then there was the independent evaluation of an outside psychologist who looked at NSA's um, claims and said, this is balderdash. In fact, um, during the fourth uh, visit to him, he leaned over the, he leaned across the desk and he said, Mrs. Stewart, if you were paranoid delusional, I just might've noticed by now and you're not. So he ended up writing 
a letter for me to my lawyer and to the NSA saying there's nothing wrong with her. She shows no signs of paranoia delusion. She does not test for paranoia, uh, paranoia and delusion. And I have to conclude that she is basically a persecuted whistleblower. So did Judge L uh, Lawrence Gallagher of the EEOC, did he miss all of this evidence and just ignore it? Or was it removed from my file in the eight years that it sat there waiting to be adjudicated? So we'll have to find out. But I did tell my lawyer, I said, you're right, we are appealing this because it's ludicrous, absolutely outrageous and ludicrous. So in my opinion, Lawrence Gallagher is either bribed or he's threatened and he has lied in his decision and he may have even tampered with the evidence that we presented for my case because like I said it's either a lie or missing uh, documents so that's that's where the EEOC lawsuit is and we are applying we are um, appealing it uh, NSA has about 40 days to do whatever it is that they're going to do and then we have 30 days to appeal and um, I got my lawyer started on the appeal already. So again, <laughs> and they say he's gonna spend a billion dollars to, to uh, uh, not pay me the million that they owe me. So, you know, that's, that's my news for the EEOC case. Yes, thanks so much, Karen. I think it's absolutely astonishing what's happened over here. First, dropping the case out of the blue after eight years, and then daring to say that they've looked through uh, the information, which they obviously haven't, and they don't have any documentation to establish that you are mentally sound. Now, that, given that you have so much documentation to establish that, you've seen so many psychologists and psychiatrists who've given you smashing reports of your brilliance and normalcy and mental soundness, which I think is demonstrated to the entire world week after week over here on Techno. <laughs> You know, and that EEOC judge has seriously got a few screws loose if he can possibly look at you and dare to say that, he, uh, dare to question your mental soundness. Um, so it's uh, absolutely astonishing. It's astounding that they can get away with such deceit because that appears to be what this is actually all about. This is about manipulation, deceit, and flat out lying. Right? And as you say, it looks like your documents have been removed from your file. If they're not even being considered, if they're not even being referenced, it appears yeah, that somebody's the, done something. Yeah, and the judge is saying that they don't exist. So he's either mm -hmm. a liar or they've been stolen. Yes, and that absolutely brings up this issue of punitive psychiatry and political psychiatry, which I think we need to hammer on about because this is 2018 USA and it might as well be 1919 Soviet Union or, you know, East Germany or Maoist China, right? It's all about using psychiatry to suppress the voices of whistleblowers to suppress the voices of reporting victims of crime, reporting victims of non-consensual human experimentation. And in this particular day and age, also reporting victims of um, extremely abusive surveillance technology use on the bodies of civilians, right? So that's what we are seeing today. And, you know, I have to always remind people of those plutonium, of the plutonium radiation experiments of the 1950s, which journalist Eileen Wilson investigated, researched, explored, and wrote about, you know, in her famous book, The Plutonium Files. I think prior to that or during that or after that, she, there were also a bunch of newspaper articles that she published to reveal what she was discovering. Basically, that in the 50s, People, ordinary people, had been experimented on by the Manhattan Project scientists in collusion with their own doctors, their own GPs, and their own specialists, you know, the oncologists and the um, orthopedists that they were working with. The particular case of Elmer Allen must be repeated over and over again. An elderly African-American gentleman who went to the doctor for his knees and 
who was enrolled in the Manhattan Project surreptitiously without his knowledge. And he was being, you know, pumped up with radiation over and over. And every time he went to the doctor and said, you know, something is wrong, I feel something is, you know, really wrong. The doctor turned around and said to him, you must be schizophrenic. And he was put down as schizophrenic and delusional for daring to speak out about what his own body was experiencing. This was in the 1950s. We are living now in the 2018s. We are living in the day and age of electromagnetic directed energy weapons, scalar weapons, sonic weapons, infrasonic weapons, ultrasonic weapons. We are living in the age of neuro weapons, incredibly sophisticated neurotechnology, which is highly invasive, microwave hearing, voice to skull technologies, the neurophone, which can put voices into people's heads through nerves in their bodies. You know, technologies which can put voices into people's heads through their auditory cortex that can bypass the ears. We're living in the age of highly sophisticated microchips that are so tiny that they are now disappearing inks and electronic tattoos. There is documentation for all of this. And this is what I have been reporting for many, many years. And, you know, all of us are aware of these documents. We've been speaking about it. We've been drawing attention to people, um, drawing to these documents and to these, um, to these experiments. We know also that the US Air Force, the US Navy, the US Army has been engaging in experiments on civilians today. We are beginning to uncover that these are non-consensual experiments. There is a lot that's in the public domain, and I know I've said this before, I'm just repeating myself, there's a lot of information about these contracts in the public domain, but there is a lot that is also being kept covert and hidden. We have information from previous statements of work on previous contracts, previous reports and declassified documents that these uh, DOD bodies have released to the public. We have information from patents as well, but apparently there are also classified patents you know, the, the patterns that are in the public domain are revealing enough. They talk about synthetic telepathy. They talk about microwave hearing. They talk about voice to skull. They talk about the remote mod modification of human emotions and human brain states from a distance through with the use of these uh, sophisticated electronic and electromagnetic and scalar technologies. You know, so that's bad enough that the information that we have that's in the public domain is bad enough. But we are learning that there's more, you know, there's a lot that's covert and classified and hidden as well. And who else can we listen to as a civilized body, as, as a group of educated professionals in society than the words of reporting victims? You know, every reporting victim is a whistleblower. Every reporting victim is a potential Elmer Allen who's speaking out. And, and what's happening now is a repeat of what happened in his time period in the 1950s, casting all reporting victims as delusional, paranoid, schizoid, mentally ill, and psychotic, which apparently is an actual uh, psychiatric term, which only psychiatrists are supposed to hand out. But this word psychotic is being freely bandied about as everybody knows who's read the, the JIT press release on my case currently, right? So, and that's a whole other story. It's a whole can of worms. There's so much to talk about and I need to publish a great deal more about it. So I won't go too much into in depth about it, except to say that I, as a journalist, spoke out about electromagnetic technologies and anti-personnel technologies to a public school official. And I was retaliated against by an anonymous reporter whose name I do know and whose name I will publish, who came out and had the goal to say that I was mentally ill, had a severe untreated mental illness, had not been chomping down on my, my medication that he apparently had given to me in a previous lifetime, and, uh, and that I was indeed psychotic. So given that petty bureaucrats, school officials can dare to say this about investigative journalists who have a great deal more knowledge about the state of the art in terms of military research today. You know, 
we have to ask the question how can how can our society exist in this fashion how do we get away with letting people these people are apparently called mandated reporters the people who get to run off to cps and tell stories and tell lies just as you know we're seeing in karen's case lies being told by eeoc judges you've got lies being told by school officials who are being permitted who are being given the authority as a mandated reporter to go and report to a child protection society that an investigative journalist is actually not practicing journalism and engaging in normal research as she should do but is psychotic so this is ridiculous this is punitive psychiatry this is false psychiatry this is political psychiatry and these authorities cannot be recognized as authorities and should not be recognized as authorities by anybody who is educated you know that's what i submit so catherine i'd be curious to hear your response to that because we're living in this age of political psychiatry we need to tackle this head on we need to challenge this head on we need to call out the people who are using mental illness labels and untreated mental illness labels in our society daring to say oh there's so much mental illness in our society we need to engage our police and engage in crisis intervention we need to uh, you know come in and do community interventions on these people who are sadly mentally ill oh no people are not mentally ill here people are highly aware and awake and much more knowledgeable than you are that doesn't make them mentally ill so you see this is a huge huge issue and i think what we need to do is begin to tackle it in many different ways you know in many different forums I, I absolutely agree. And I think we also need a multi-pronged attack because there's so much tied up here. I, I, I wanted to start with a comment on, on Karen's case because I think what we're seeing here, so we heard um, a, a several um, techno crime fighter episodes back about um, Dr. Millicent's black case, who sadly can't be here today, but she had a court case that was fraught with corruption and sabotage. She was even, um, I think she was even sexually assaulted while she was standing up before a judge with um, Randy Webster several seats behind her, you know, playing on his mobile phone while, while her chips were being triggered. So that's the scale of criminality we're talking about. But also the judge, I feel, was um, acting in a corrupt fashion. Her case was blocked. She was set up for even more abuse. Now we have Karen, whose case has been on hold for eight years. I mean, what that in itself is uh, some acts of corruption. Um, and then there's also, of course, the case of uh, Melanie Richan in Brussels, which was I this it was the textbook definition of corruption, I would say. And she already had one, um, you know, um, experience with the courts when her the custody was um, the custody of her son was taken away. Um, I have witnessed several court cases in Switzerland that were rife with corruption. And I think what we have to start um, doing is realize that all of our systems are in deep capture. So the actual, you know, starting point has to be um, actually, you know, <laughs> by the way, I do get feedback. I think somebody's microphone is being amplified. Uh, I have this kind of like oscillating buzzing on my end. One of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to... Um, open up the discussion and to say let's move and let's make a uh, deep capture the premise so we all start off by yes i think i uh, thank you thank you now i can actually hear myself i think we can um you know we should start off the entire argument not to not to well, we have to recognize the courts at some point but we have to start saying the courts are staffed by people who can be corrupted who can be criminals, who can be psychopaths themselves, who can be pedophiles, and they might be plants. They might be plants by the organized crime network. So what do we do in this situation? We have seen in the intel agencies and the police and all of the systems and hospitals that they seem to be in deep capture. And the courts, if we're talking deep capture, the courts and the police and the intel agencies are the first places to be captured. You know, any crime um, cartel would start first there. So what sort of evidence might we have to argue in a, in a court of law that uh, certain judgments have to be questioned and actually entire cases have to be retried because it might turn out that those people who were 
masquerading as judges were no judges. They were actually agents of, say, the Crown Corporation, agents of the crime cartel, or they were just outright corrupted criminals, you know? And um, the, the court systems, from the systems analysis point of view, it's very easy to argue this case because the court systems are vast. They incorporate thousands of judges, you know, um, thousands of um, court of appeal judges and hundreds of Supreme Court judges. Now, as soon as you have 100 people, statistically, one person is already a psychopath. So as soon as you're talking about groups of people with more than 100, you have to say statistically one of them will be a, a psychopath, which means that they will be ruthless. They will not have a conscience, you know, as uh, I think Jim Fallon was the neurologist who made the, um, the brain images, you know, the entire frontal lobe is not active. These people have entire modules, entire bits of their brain not working, and they seem highly functional to us, but they lack major aspects that make us human, which is compassion and this high assimilation of putting yourself into the situation of somebody else and actually feeling compassion and feeling their pain almost as if it was your own. These people don't have that. So when you have a judge like that, you are dealing with somebody who can, at the drop of a hat, be, in principle, from his hardware set up, also be a serial killer. And he can also be a pathological liar without even without showing the typical micro expression sometimes that other people show you know so th psychopaths have i think they still show micro expressions but they have a distorted and a highly suppressed uh you know version of them because the entire frontal lobe is not working <laughs> you know it's it's literally that bad so from the systems analysis point of view it goes without saying that you have to be able to question judges and now for society, the question is, what sort of um, tests will we apply to see if a judge was maybe corrupted, you know? And this is not a theoretical argument. And I would like to bring up, and I, I'm, I'm sorry to write, you know, on about this case, but the case of Justice Scalia is a textbook example because there have been massive irregularities in his death. And this is relevant for the US and relevant worldwide because it might hint at something much darker lying there. So while I do not want to smear Justice Scalia in particular, I do want to use the case, raise massive questions, and say, well, if those questions are answered a certain way, under certain hypothesis, then certain other judges have to be able to be questioned another way, okay? And this is even more pertinent when we're dealing with a massive global conspiracy you know, related to an organized crime cartel. So just on the, the public available information that's out there on Justice Scalia, and, and please let me run with this argument for a bit, um, I would like to draw people's attention to uh, the Alex Jones reporting of Justice Scalia. And it said, Justice Scalia died surrounded by Luciferians. Okay, so when you look at the actual video, I don't want to play it here, but, um, you know, um, attention is drawn to the fact that the place where he died had satanic masks okay i think these are images from the hotel where he died okay so with little beds in the corridor you know i have seen a hotel in brussels that was ac um, advertising on booking.com with similar similar you know uh lines of beds and the thing about this brussels hotel was the um the beds were antiques and in the front here, the headboard was pretty tall. And um, when it was closed, the headboard, it was just like oak. And when, when you actually looked at it, you realized it had panels that could be opened, right? Three sides that had mirrors and the beds were rather short, like almost for children. Okay, so these places where there's systematic rape and murder of children exists, and based on the reporting that Alex Jones made of this case, uh, it makes me think that this place might just be one of them, okay? Now, anyway, I, I am not saying anything at this point. I'm saying look at the uh, reporting that's publicly available, okay? Check it up and then ask yourself, what does it mean? And also, one of the things I would like to draw your attention to definitely is the fact that uh, Justice Scalia was linked to this uh, secret society that is called, oh, hang on here, somewhere there's the actual logo, 
Yeah, uh, this is the uh, Saint Hubertus, okay? The order of Saint Hubertus, which has this stag, you know, and this cross as its recognizing symbol. Now, that is massively, massively important because these secret organizations are tied into um, the global mafia, okay? They tied into the, the secret societies, um, are tied into the secret services, and both of them are tied into this global secret um, cabal, okay? But um, there's so much more in this that we need to follow up, okay? So this is just just the Scalia and the connection to St. Hubertus. By the way, this thing of the stag, right, um, will reappear many, many times. Um, I think um, Alex Jones points out that it also appears on, um, on a German alcoholic drink, called Jägermeister, and also more tellingly, and tying in with um, other stuff I was saying earlier, it, the stag, oops, um, sorry, am I still online, by the way? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, absolutely, everything's working ah, okay. Okay, okay, so something happened, sorry, let me just switch back because I wanted to show you something. This is really important, and I'm going somewhere with this, guys um oh yeah here yeah. okay sorry i i just panicked i thought i've lost the connection because i did earlier okay so the the stag symbol is also on the crest of my old oxford college hartford college okay and i didn't used to think that this is important but now i really do think it's important okay because i do think that the oxford colleges are tied in to the vatican crime cartel through the city of london corporation Okay, and last week I was making the case that uh, St. John's College was founded by the one of the richest um, guilds in the city of London. And now my other college, where I was as an undergraduate and graduate, Hartford College, has the same stag head as the secret organization where Justice Scalia was a member. Okay, now the St. Hubertus Order has this cross. Okay, as its logo, Hartford College, on the other hand, has a very similar logo that looks like the Maltese cross, right? The cross of Malta. And it also looks like a cross, a Christian cross, you know? So it's almost like the Vatican order, you know, the Vatican link right there. You've got the cross and on top of that, the Maltese cross. And this ties it in with all sorts of stuff, including Switzerland and the Knights of St. John's. Okay, and also note the colors, red and white, red and white, and then this, you know, cross that looks very much like the one in Switzerland. Um, so all this stuff is super important. And when you have a Supreme Court judge like Justice Scalia being involved in this sort of activity, then dying and then the autopsy being refused, and his family not being interested in an autopsy and finding out how exactly, you know, their family member died. And then, you know, it being tied to Luciferianism and it being tied, the, 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 the hotel owner being tied into all sorts of stuff, you know, I really ask you to investigate. Then I think what we're seeing is the tip of um, the iceberg of massive judicial corruption. And now I have a personal interest in, in uh, emphasizing judicial corruption simply because if you go to the um, UK Supreme Court, okay, so that is, um, sorry, uh, uh, where the hell is it here? If you go to the UK Supreme Court, right, um, you have, first of all, all sorts of uh, covert uh, signaling in the logo, but that's for another day. But then when you go to the biography of the judges, as I point out many, many times, this judge, Lord Sumption, stalked me in Oxford and in Munich. And in both cases, you know, literally within, in Munich, it was within 50 meters of my flat in Munich. Okay. So the question is, what is this guy involved in? right, that he has access to where I live quite liberally and can, you know, has a group of men where he can organize street theater and stalking um, exercises. So here I can personally say under oath that this guy stalked me, um, okay, and with Justice Scalia, we've got other stuff that connects him So uh, to, to very dodgy stuff. So at this point, we really have to start asking, 
when you have stuff like that being uncovered about the judges, how much can you rely on, you know, in the judiciary? Isn't this already the tip of the iceberg when at the highest level you have to study stuff? So we have to start asking questions about the lower levels. Now, one other thing I wanted to say, this is actually a PDF document that gives people actual ammunition to start questioning stuff um, in, a, in a much more tangible way. Let me share my screen and point you to one piece of work I did. So if you go to my website, please go to FAQ. Okay, this is this one. Then go down to the info pack, click on this button. And that's where the documents are on this page. And go down to uh, here, evidence of systemic corruption and click on the PDF for the Investigatory Powers Tribunal in the United Kingdom, okay? Now, this is a piece of work I did and I signed with my name, and it comes with numbered lines. So this is in a, in a you know, um, in the hope that you might use it in court because you're very welcome to, okay? I signed this document and it contains my analysis of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal and their own statistics in the UK. And I am making the argument that their own statistics show that they are a captured court. They are entirely captured because their own statistics show that 99.8% of the cases are rejected. All right. In fact, 99.1% um, are knocked out by the tribunal itself, but they are even rejecting cases before that. So when their own statistics show that they are rejecting 99% of all the cases, this is not a functional tribunal. This is a fraud. Okay. The investigatory powers tribunals is one big fat fraud. Uh, that's what this means. Um, then there's other evidence. Also stated on my website, if you go back, okay, and this is just to show you um, the, the scale of things. I think if you go down to court cases, I have put a page here for Gerhard, Gerhard Ulrich, okay. If you click on that, um, this is the statement of what he um, uncovered. So he's got a, a book published about judiciary corruption. But he also uncovered that in the European Court of um, Human Rights, and this is mentioned here in this video, um, pretty much over 90% of all the cases are rejected. And I think I'm, I'm just scrolling down to see if I'm, I've typed out the actual numbers. But I think, um, so you have to read it yourself. I can't remember what I've written there. But um, the fact is that I think the European Court of Human Rights gets about 40,000 cases or 50,000 cases. And um, they are accepting, I think, a, a 1% or less. And all the other people get fobbed off with a standard <laughs> sentence saying, you don't qualify. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Why are they trying to What is the reason they are giving? Um, they I, and I have to I have to ask Gerhard Ulrich because I think we should put the standard um, letter up online. I think it's up on his website. I have to um, pull it out, but it's a standard sentence saying I think something like "Oh, you know, your case doesn't qualify," or "You know, the court's not in charge," or some some nonsense like that. So, and and what I want to say to people is, in the olden days, we used to have respect for these organizations, and it almost think like, "Oh, this is something passed down." by God, you know, and but it's not. It's passed down by a bunch of criminals who I think we have now a strong reason to believe are tied to a massive organized crime cartel that's also involved in child trafficking, you know? Absolutely. I think that's very important to mention. I'm so glad you brought that up, Catherine, because I think ultimately when we look at what constitutes authority in our midst, we have to ask ourselves, who gives them that authority? By what authority do these authorities take authority, you know, over the rest of the populace? And if that, as we are increasingly beginning to discover, is actually organized crime, then I think as civilized humans, you know, as normal humanity everywhere on the planet, we need to stand up and start saying, and st well, first we need to find out what exactly is going on. As you say, we need to investigate, we need to find out the, the true connections and the true nature of the corruption that's endemic over here. And we need to stand up and say, well, I'm sorry, but we're not interested in giving power to criminals. You know, we are interest we're not interested in recognizing the power that criminals have in our midst. We will not recognize that authority 
That is not the authority that we as humanity stand for. You know, we are much more interested in harmonious community. We are much more interested in justice and goodness and, and correctness rather than this kind of incredible, invidious betrayal of everything that any society can stand for, you know, which is what is being practiced currently with all of this pedophilia, this child trafficking, incredible child abuse. And unfortunately, it seems to be that not only do we have secret societies and judicial corruption, underneath that we have this extremely filthy layer of child abuse and child trafficking that is really the seamy side of all of our societies around the world today, definitely Western society, you know. And mm -hmm. so that's unfortunately where we are today. And we need to, as investigators, um, begin to be unafraid, I think, to, to unearth that. And there are many analysts, I think, out there, a lot of investigators, a lot of people in old media are beginning to speak out about the child abuse and the child trafficking. But the more we are all finding out about it, I think we're beginning to find out that that's at the core that's at the core of this extreme corruption that's you know on the surface that we come up against. How could the European Court of Human Rights turn away 90% of the cases that come to their doorstep? How could they do it and get away with it and call themselves a European Court of Human Rights? That's not human rights, you know? I, I don't know what that is. And, and you know what, I think there are several things because we have spent now an entire year of uncovering corruption and, and providing the evidence for it. And now I think 2018 is, is the, the year of action. So 2017 was for me the year of investigation and making connections and also making social networking connections, trying to find the right investigators. And 2018 is now the year of action where we have to take people to court. We have to restore the integrity of the court. We have to a civilization exactly as you say find out where do people take authority from what are they entitled to and put in safeguards and i think every single one of our institutions has to be totally remodeled you know because we have discovered the courts are corrupted they are actually i would say totally dysfunctional they are they are staffed by corrupt judges and gerhard Ulrich has actually got the data on it he's got a database of i think five thousand corrupt judges um, he knows that, you know, the European Court of Human Rights is, um, is corrupted. I have got evidence from systems analysis and from the, you know, investigative powers tribunal that allows me to prove that they are corrupted. And then at some point we have to say, hang on, this is so egregious. Could it be by design? You know, and then we have to we have to start asking other questions. And as we're peeling back the layers, you know, um, to cut to the chase, we'll find out that actually everything that we call civil society has been a big facade that has been put up for us to believe that there's some sort of mechanisms. And it has been put up by um, an organized crime cartel that is staffed by absolute serial killing psychopaths at the top. So, um, you know, and, and um, psychopaths have this ability that they are pathological liars. They have no problem lying and they are rather good at it, you know, and they derive, um, you know, a lot of joy. But um, starting on the action side of it, I would like to kick off the conversation of what the hell to do. And, and earlier we are late because Ramola was telling us about a lot of stuff that um, she uncovered and that, um, you know, measures she is taking to reclaim her rights and so on. So I would like to open the floor on the action side. I've got two things to report, guys, okay? So number one, to just finish off this discussion, I encourage people as a first primer, this is something that helped me, okay? As a first primer, I encourage everybody to read The Rule of Law by um, Tom Bingham, okay? This is a very short book. It's really, really short, and you can hold it as a primer, but there he... Um, outlines the basics of what the rule of law even means. But what I'm trying to say is this is not enough. So this is, um, I, sorry to be so arrogant, but this is, you know, the take of somebody from the social sciences when, with a background in law and with a background in physics and the physics of systems, I say that there are some big elements missing here. And those are the safeguards against deep capture and the courts need to have a mechanism to recover from deep capture because deep capture is a natural process in all pyramid organizations. Okay, this is what I'm saying. So 
But one argument I would like to bring to the table is that we all have to start saying, if we're redesigning our um, all of these organizations, for example, um, William Binney, um, former technical director of the NSA, went on public record saying that in his view, the entire intelligence agencies have to be abolished and redesigned from scratch. And I agree with that. Now, if we do that, however, we, I would say we need to put on from day one safety mechanisms against deep capture because deep capture will occur naturally. It's a law of freaking physics, okay? So psychopaths will rise to the top, criminals will rise to the top, and once the top is captured, a system cannot recover by itself because it would require the criminals sacking themselves, which they're not gonna do. And this is what, what's happening to the CIA. And I would like to um, tie in one current discussion just as a, as a you know, tiny, tiny uh, little footnote here, which is, I think, important for future, because while we're talking, what's going on um, in the background is also that uh, Gina, hang on here, yeah, Gina Haspel is um, in line to become the next director of the CIA, this woman here, and the big discussion about her is that uh, she seems to have overseen torture. And um, there are former intel agents publishing articles saying, um, you know, she has been uh, actually arguing against her, um, you know, appointment. And this is super important because if these people are right and she was overseeing the black um, torture sites of the CIA abroad, it means that number one, she's working for the organized crime cartel. Number two, she goes against absolutely everything that the U.S. Constitution and the U.S. Republic stood for. Right. And number three, it means that she's severely mentally ill. OK, she is most likely a psychopath. Right. She, but it absolutely means that she is severely ill. And she cannot be in charge of the CIA if she is mentally ill. OK. And um, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that Germany has um, a charity Okay, the ECCHR that has actually filed with the German federal prosecutor, the Generalbundesanwalt, as it's called in this catchy way, um, an arrest warrant, an, an actual arrest warrant for CIA Deputy Director Gina Haspel. Okay, and this was, um, I, I yeah. think it, it yeah. was filed on the 6th of June 2017. Yes. All right. So there is in Europe an actual, you know, an arrest warrant filed. And uh, what I would expect is the General Bundesanwalt is going to sit on this for I don't know what, a decade? I don't know, but there's not a fat lot of action and it's almost a year later. Okay. So the General Bundesanwalt might be a corrupt uh, person himself which is what I expect from systems analysis. But the fact is that an arrest warrant has been filed for, and, and then this page outlines why. So I encourage everybody to, to Google the ECCHR. It's in English, and I think it's also available in German. And really start reading up about this case, okay? And, and, and start thinking, if this is true, and if this woman is involved in all these things and has overseen the site, and, and by the way, what has been reported in, on these black sites is that people who were just writing dissident poetry and stuff like that, were captured and were tortured, and the torture involved, for example, um, smashing their testicles with iron bars and smashing their feet with iron bars. And that's the mm -hmm. kind of stuff that I read. Now I ask, when you have the military apparatus of the United States, the size that it is, I don't think that any one man's testicles will be a threat to national security. So what happened at those sites is not actually anything to do with national security. It's not even a military operation, but it has everything to do with psychopathy and sexual sadism. And this means that Gina Haspel has been employing sexual sadists to live out their psychopathy on the prisoners. And the question is why? And I would like to put this on the table that what the black sites were is not even national security. What the black sites were were sadistic pornography production sites. And, and I possibly like to say, also you know, possibly also satanic ritual abuse sites. Exactly. And I think 
that what has happened at places like the CIA black sites and also at Guantanamo Bay, by the way, is that they were recording highly violent snuff movies and sadistic porn. You know, and, and I think this is and, what it's about. And they were probably harvesting electromagnetic energies taken out of these people subjected to extreme terror because this is what our investigations into the state of the art regarding electromagnetic technologies leads to that basically you know everything is radio frequencies every emotion has a signature radio frequency associated with it and these signatures are indeed being harvested by the covert officers you know in the NSA, the CIA, MI5, MI6. All of this is connected to secret society behavior, secret sadist behavior, satanic ritual abuse, all of this very, very dark stuff. And again, it, there's a connection there with tormenting children as well, you know, abusing children to the point of extreme torment and ultimately child sacrifice as well, which is also surfacing currently, the knowledge of which is surfacing in our society, in our midst. Absolutely. And one little, um, you know, personal um, statement I would like to make to this effect. And the reason why I say so is because some more than one witness has come forward and reported something strikingly similar. So I would like to make public um, the, the fact that my gra I believe that my grandfather was murdered in my presence at Hospital Baden-Baden. And um, the circumstances of that make me think that this is exactly what has happened at the time. So because this is an actual um, <laughs> evidence, a testimony I give um, before witnesses, I would like to do it under oath. Uh, so I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So what happened at Hospital Baden-Baden is that, and this is uh, you know very relevant to what's happening right now because i have sought refuge in hungary i would like to reveal i am in hungary people okay because i'm an ethnic hungarian and i sought refuge in hungary when i had to flee my flat now hungary was exactly where my grandfather was in the weeks before he died and he came here and okay he was you know older he was retired and uh, he wasn't in the health of a 20 year old but when he came to Hungary, he was not as poorly as when he was when he left. And this has never occurred to me, but now that I'm here, I'm actually in the house where he was um, in the weeks before he died. And um, what now the family friends who saw him at the time reported is that he started swelling up. He started retaining a lot of water, which is identical to what Millicent reports, what many other people who are victim of electromagnetic weapons report. This is why it's relevant. So my grandfather started, his limbs started swelling up, his stomach swelled up massively, and it retained a lot of water. He became so very ill here that he asked, um, you know, the family to take him back to Germany, um, and he lived in Baden-Baden at the time. And we, um, we took him back and he went straight to hospital. Now, I, I was living in Geneva at the time, or I was living on the French side near Geneva at the time. And, um, you know, I had a phone call with him. And when I heard how poorly he was, I drove straight there. I drove from Geneva all the way to Baden-Baden and I went straight into the hospital. Now, when I arrived, I thought at the time this was really kind. And now I realize it was the most psychopathic thing these people could have done because the hospital was nice enough to say, look, your grandfather's dying. Here's a, uh, you know, the hospital Baden Baden has double rooms. So there are two beds in each room. And they gave me one of the beds to be able to stay with my grandfather throughout. Okay, so I stayed, and this is also relevant. I stayed with my grandfather three days and three nights exactly until he died. Now, every morning when I woke up after a few hours of sleep, right, in the bed next to the bed of my grandfather, I would wake up and think, oh my God, it feels like I have a sunburn on the top of my head. Now, this was not a sunburn. This was me lying in a hospital bed with my head pointing towards the wall. And I think my head was being microwaved to read out, I don't know what, the brain waves for grieving or my mental state, my emotional state, while I was caring for my grandfather the last three days of his life. So this is it. My the top of my head was burnt every single night, fresh, right? So what this means to me is that there was neurotechnology and microwaves involved at Hospital Baden Baden. Now then my grandfather died. Okay, the third night, and this is also relevant because my grandmother died exactly to the day, 
two years beforehand. My grandmother died on the 8th of the 8th, 2008, at 4.30 a.m. My grandfather died on the 8th of the 8th, 2010, at exactly 4.30 a.m. to the minute. Now, what was even more relevant and involves intel is that when my grandfather died, okay, I this was the first time I was actually with somebody the moment they died. Um, it was very distressing, as you can imagine. And then I just, you know, burst out into tears when I realized he had died and I turned my head away from the hospital bed. My gaze went straight through the window and there was a tree outside the window. And the moment I did that, two black crows landed in the tree. Okay, that's nothing unusual, Fly birds fly around. However, those two crows stayed in the tree for exactly two hours or something thereabouts. And they did not fly away. And I noticed looking over to them repeatedly, every single time one of the crows started flapping its wings, something would happen and it would settle down. Now, I believe that what actually happened to the crows is that they were being brain controlled with a chip and the signal was sent for them to settle down. But I will just now tell the entire story because it ties in with a bunch of stuff. And this is all important. It relates to courts, to intel, and a bunch of other stuff. So please bear with me. So what happened is that I decided I'm not going to call my family at 4.30 a.m. I'm going to wait until 6 a.m. So in that time, I talked to the doctors. I arranged all the stuff and so on. The crows were there all throughout. I didn't leave the room. Now, in the end... At 6 a.m., I called the family. I gathered together some stuff. And roughly two hours after, you know, my grandfather died, I left the room. I said goodbye to my grandfather, went to the door, and I looked back to him. And my gaze fell through the door. And that's the moment the two crows took off. It's when I touched the door handle, the two crows took off. Okay. So pretty unusual for the two crows to, to hang around for that long. But then I went down into the car park. It was outside, and when I reached my car, two crows landed on the tree next to my car. So I got into the car, and I thought, this is a bit unusual. I drove, um, and I drove to rejoin my family, or the part of my family who lived nearby, um, and it was <laughs> reaching the final roundabout where my family lives. I had to slow down, and two crows landed in the street, in the lane in front of my car. So I had to slow down, stop my car, look at the crows. The crows were walking up and down and eventually decided to take off. And that's when I could proceed. Now, at that point, I thought this is pretty strange. Okay. But I just, it was one of those things where I was so emotionally upset. I just recorded all this and it happened and I didn't think about it any further. It was just one of those things. Now, what I think was the plan is to somehow trigger some sort of superstitious or religious sentiment in me. Thank goodness there's not a trace, okay? And this entire thing with the crows was put on as a show. Now, I am 100% convinced that this was a show and these crows were being remote controlled because years later, you know, almost six years later, in January 2006, I went to, um, to London to the Investigatory Powers Tribunal Court case of Philip Kerr versus MI5. And Philip Kerr complained about MI5 training crows to harass him. So the training of crows is one of the things Intel does and British Intel does. Okay. And now add to this, there's something called uh, the um, Association of Old Crows. Uh, let me bring it up. Yes. Uh, let me share my screen because this is where the circle closes. And now I'm coming back to everything that we need to do, guys. So the Association of Old Crows, if you Google it, you will see this logo, right, with the crow inside. Now, the Association of the Old Crows is an international professional organization specializing in electronic warfare. And this is their old logo. Electronic warfare, people. Okay. And the reason why they're called Old Crows, this is a name that emerged from the first use of electronic warfare in World War II to disrupt access communications and radars. Allied equipment and operators were known by the code name Raven. Common jargon changed uh, the name to Crows, and those engaged in the profession became known as Old Crows. 
So blah, 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 the organization draws expertise and information from its members, a pool of thousands of individuals, including technology specialists and actual military personnel, um, you know, and is involved in advancing electronic warfare and information gathering techniques, disseminating information on these topics and supporting the education of personnel in related scientific matters. It publishes the Journal of Electronic Defense, blah, 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 right? A journal covering, covering intelligent international developments in the field of electronic warfare, signals intelligence, electronic intelligence, and communications intelligence, which these days I would argue is also the reading of brain waves or brain chips. Now, their logo is a crow, and I'd, I would like to submit uh, the following theory that the, their logo is a crow because the crow is one of those animals that was first brain controlled remotely by electronic warfare techniques, I would say. It's already known that the Nazis and other people were trying to control animals in World War II. There was famously the remote controlled dolphins trying to do mine sweeping operations and planting you know mines attaching them to the to the hull of ships and so on in world war ii so the remote control of animals has been around in an ongoing operation since the second world war but i would say that flying animals are particularly good for intelligence gathering so that's the connection to the crows so i would say that with all this right um it's pretty clear from all this to me that Intel was involved, they staged this crow bullshit. They did the same thing with Philip Kerr, you know. Um, and crows are tied to electronic warfare, they are can be remote controlled, blah blah blah. But coming back to the water retention, and this affects a lot of people. When my um after my grandfather died, the nurses came in to prepare him for you know burial and so on and so on. And when they were maneuvering uh the body um the the torso the top part of the torso toppled over and about a liter of clear water flew out of my grandfather's lungs this was not stomach content this was clear fluid that came straight out of his lungs so what i'm trying to say is that there was so much water retention i think my grandfather might literally have drowned but the connection to all this targeting is that a lot of victims are reporting the swelling okay so this is now trying to draw all of this stuff together you know and, and catherine that particular aspect i think you know um, of your grandfather having all this water in the lungs i think there are some medical terms for that water in the lungs between the layers um etc um and also pneumonia that many people suffer from just before they die and you know it's uh, extreme cases of pneumonia etc the thing to understand is these electromagnetic technologies can actually induce these these diseases you know and that's the horrifying situation that we find ourselves in as humanity today. And this is why it's important, I think, for us to collect all of this information regarding the bio effects of these electromagnetic technologies, which is slowly filtering out from some declassified documents, you know, and this is why we need people to do FOIA requests. We need to get the information from the military that they do have, some of which, which you know, we do have in the public domain now, through through virtue of its being declassified but some of which is still being hidden we need to show people this connection between these so-called non-lethal weapons which are really non-lethal not non-lethal i mean if they can induce extreme disease and extreme illness up to the point of death that's a lethal weapon isn't it you know so we need to understand that connection between these weapons and the effects the actual bio effects they're producing in the human body i actually want to show a couple of documents so whenever you're done catherine i'll, I'll show people those documents i absolutely i think we should move on to move, um these documents because i brought up this um this thing to open the floor to to several discussions i, I just wanted to say two more things which is relevant also for court cases so this entire thing with my grandfather started in hungary i think he was murdered in front of my eyes um in hospital baden baden because the timing the statistical likelihood of die dying within the minute um you know uh, as your wife 
uh, who died on the 8th of the 8th, 2008, and we know about all this cartel signaling, you know, to do, to do with the um, date of death. Another important um, factor, which is part of my investigation that I did now, is the flat where my grandmother died, um, because to us it appeared that she died of old age and natural causes in her flat. Um, what happened is that my grandfather moved out after her death, but the new tenants, and now, you know, listen to this, the new tenants had to electromagnetically shield the bedroom because they felt, the woman, the woman felt that she was being attacked with electromagnetic weapon, right? In the very flat where my grandfather, uh, grandparents lived and where my grandmother died on the 8th of the 8th, 2008. So I think electromagnetic weapons have been operational and led to her death you know, because the date is just so unusual. And I think then Intel hired the flat next door and continued shooting at the family. And I think it's also telltale sign that the woman and this couple who moved in there was suffering so much more as the guy because we know that for reasons of sexual violence, they're attacking women so much harder. And this is something that was also confirmed by Siegfried Thomas. He says that his wife in Switzerland is being attacked so much harder than himself. And I hear that over and over and over. You know, so uh, what I'm trying to say, and I make a, a public testimony about this because you guys can download the video. So the people who are watching quote me on this, this, all this stuff is going into my affidavit. But what I'm giving you is I'm tying in Hungarian Intel. I'm trying tying in the hospital of Baden Baden. And I know that other people have problems with hospital Baden Baden. And I think there's a massive Intel operation. The entire region of Baden-Württemberg is also doing electromagnetic warfare and covert murder operations. This is what I'm saying. I'm tying in all this Raven bull crap because um, Philip Kerr has experienced that. He also reported other women being harassed with ravens. And I'm telling you, this is the mechanism. It's brain chipping and uh, you know remote signals of these poor animals. Um, it also ties in a lot of remote control of other animals, which a lot of victims report, you know, and all of these things are being now put together. And, and also, most importantly, the inf involvement of hospitals, you know, because Melanie Richan's baby was kidnapped by Hospital Erasmus in Brussels. So now in 2018, we're putting all these puzzle pieces together. And the final thing I would like to say on, on this topic is just that I have now written, I have requested, officially requested protection from the Hungarian government. I have written to the Prime Minister of Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban. I have written to the ambassador, um, the Hungarian ambassador to Germany, because I'm a German national, but ethnic Hungarian. I have written to the three main heads of uh, domestic Hungarian intel, foreign Hungarian intel, and the general in charge of counterterrorism in, Hungarian, uh, in Hungary. And I have requested protection, asylum, you know, for the... Uh, purpose of writing up my court case and the cease of uh, the cease of my current attacks and um, none of this was granted um, the the German uh, the Hungarian ambassador whose job I think it is to get back to me refused to reply to my emails he already refused about half a year ago when I um, requested ref um, you know refuge in Hungary and um, domestic Hungarian Intel, replied to me and i can tell you i'm going to publish my entire com correspondence after the show but one of the things that they um said let me find the letter uh so domestic hungarian intel said uh dear madam we would like to inform you concerning your inquiry with the subject formal request for protection that you had sent uh to the email address of the constitution protection office um ah the tasks and competencies of the AH is stipulated by the Act, uh, what's that, 25 of 1995 on the National Security Services 5. Uh, I think that's meant to be paragraph 5. And based uh, on the Act, it may be established that your request does not fall under the competency of the AH. Therefore, the AH is not entitled to launch a proceeding and to carry out measures. We suggest you to contact the local police authority of your residency should the suspicion of a criminal act emerge in order to investigate your actual or perceived violations of rights. We appreciate your acknowledgement of the above written. Best regards, Constitution Protection Office. Now, um, this is the current status quo of my situation. And um, the, the point is that they referred me to a 40-page act 
um, and I have to get back to them, which pretty much outlines yes, they aren't in, in charge. So the situation we have now is that um, Hungarian domestic intel basically wrote back to me and says, oh, we don't think we're in charge, are we? You know, and re they referred me to this law. And yes, they very much are in charge. And meanwhile, the situation is that I am being literally machine gunned to smithereens here. So uh, behind me, I can maybe show I am sleeping oh, under this, which is a lead blanket, which is a radiation protection curtain, you know, um it's weighs 15 kilograms so i'm sleeping under this and i can barely breathe every night but i'm going to bed and most importantly i'm being woken up by targeted shots to the head literally and they make like many other victims they make my entire body jolt by sending hard electromagnetic pulses into my spine and into my limbs and i am being machine gunned day and night so my life here has become just as hard as in Switzerland. I'm being stalked by the National Surveillance Network. I was also bruised up by directed shots into my body. And this is all why I'm trying to work um, after having sought refuge. So the bottom line is, I would like to say that Hungarian intel is involved in crimes against humanity as well. And at this point, I would like to publicly declare that I think that they are responsible for the targeted murder of my grandfather in conjunction with German intelligence and most likely also British intelligence who rule uh, uh, German intelligence apparently according to this, the statements of the head of Austrian intel. So this is the situation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you, and you know when people uh, when you can actually break it down to that, you know, and you can actually show that it appears intel agencies were involved. I think all of us around the world, I mean, everybody, I mean, humanity, you know, have to kind of look at each of our family situations, each of the incidents that occurred to any of us, whether it's sudden illness in a, in a family member or a sudden death. And ask yourself, you know, in this day and age of these these weapons that are being used, is it not possible that every one of us is being manipulated? Is it not possible that every one of us is susceptible to being manipulated in this way? That, you know, illness can be induced in the human body in this way. Death can be induced in the human body, in the human family. And so this is why, you know, this sort of brings me to this whole point that we are at today where Alfred has come up with his model statute initiative to ban electromagnetic weapons and ban neural weapons, ban these directed energy weapons in our midst. I think it's very important to bring it back to that point because these are deadly weapons. They are being kind of passed off with all of these euphemisms, electronic, non-lethal, anti-personnel, these are very quiet words. They are designed to ameliorate and palliate the actual situation. The actual situation is death, destruction, and really deadly technology, you know, that's being used in us. Because it can actually, it can make a normal person insane or depressed. You know, it can make a person paranoid. It can make a person fearful. It can make a person angry. It can make a person very sick you know, whether it's through pneumonia or mimicking the symptoms of food poisoning, giving them, you know, um, intestinal pains, stomach pains, heart pains. It can attack the heart from a distance. You know, much has been made of the CIA's heart attack weapon, where they apparently had little ice dots or something of the sort. Uh, but I mean, the CIA doesn't need that anymore. They've got like a you know a whole platter of remote control weapons currently to hit the heart with. They can you know they can do it with they can do it with chips or they can just do it with military tracking radar. You know at the what? Right, right I, intensity. I actually think that little heart attack gun was a little psyop. It was actually a psyop to think, ooh, Could you know the, the state of the art technology of the CIA that we've just discovered is to what to shoot little icicles into the human body that then dissolve and give you a heart attack. Uh, hang on, are we not discovering that these electromagnetic weapons have been around pretty much since electricity has been around, right? Going back to probably the, the end of the 19th century at least, right? Uh, so, you know, it, it, what it means is that certainly since the 1940s and 50s, they had the ability to induce an instant heart attack by sending an electromagnetic pulse, right? Yeah. And then yeah, in the exactly. 70s, they come with freaking icicles. I mean, what? Why? 
you know I think entirely possible i think karen might know something about that but you know entirely possible that it was all a complete ruse right Well, I, I would say that, yeah, that's very plausible that they're t saying, look over here, no, don't look over there. Um, because what, it, it just strikes me that, um, you know, the, the wars that we have been engaged in have whetted their appetite for more and more war, more and more weapons, more and more control, more and more money. So they've said, the heck with the wars between the countries we're just going to basically pretend the same dangers are out there but we're going to war on our own people and what Catherine said about the people who moved into her grandmother's flat after her grandmother passed away this is a conveyor belt they already had that that flat set up to murder people so they just kept it going it didn't matter who who moved in next i mean there are people who are targets because they're whistleblowers or journalists or truth tellers or whatever but that goes to prove that it's a conveyor belt of anybody who's in the wrong time, in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay, let's kill those people. They're there. They're convenient. We've got the stuff set up. So the um, conveyor belt just keeps going, going, going. So when people tell you it doesn't affect me, I'm not a journalist. No, but you could move into the wrong apartment next year and then you're dead. You know? and, and these weapons are now miniaturized. They're in little RFID readers, you know, they're in barcode readers, they're in, literally, they're in our cell phones, you know, mm -hmm. so cell phones or cell phone-like instruments can be used. Um, and I should tell you, last week, I went to the mall, you know, with my daughter and I went shopping. The entire time that I was there, I was being tracked and I was being physically tracked on my nerves. Okay, and at one point, I kept looking around to see how on earth it was being done. Because as we know, we know now about different modalities of delivery. Satellite technologies, cell tower technologies, portable weapons, cell, cell phones, etc. My, my suspicion always was, it's a very finite, short precision beam coming at me from very close by. And so I was looking around to see who is using cell phones in my vicinity. And I did on several occasions notice what what people were using in my vicinity and these are young people who look like they're working there or just shopping they were using something that looks like a cell phone but it's a little bit fatter than a cell phone now when i was at old navy i went up to the counter and i saw the woman using this thing but she used both to barcode read the clothes that i was handing over you know which have the rfid tag now everything has an rfid tag so she was using the same instrument which looks like a little fat cell phone to read the tag and then she turned it over and i could you know put in my credit card info there as well and I started talking to her about it, and I noticed it said gap device. And I think we can look this up and we can investigate this further because what's gap is, you know, the, the company gap. So apparently the company gap owns this little device. And what it is, is both a kind of two in one RFID reader and credit card, um, you know, device as well. So think about it that particular thing, if it's receiving radio frequency it can also transmit radio frequency right so catherine maybe that's something i wanted to send you the links that i started to look up and you know we should we should investigate that a little bit further to see what exactly that was because i think that is something very small very nifty and that can easily be used by people um, I walked out of one store and there was a woman standing outside with a little with a little device, the same kind of device in her hand. And I said to her, you know, it's amazing what people will do for money, isn't it? And she said, mm-hmm. And she walked on. Exactly. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Because, you know, that's the way you can uh, you can always tell is that um, when they know what it's about and you just jump on them, they will not react like normal people. If she didn't know what this was about, she'd be like, what? 
you know? Like, exactly. Right? Oh, it was very obvious. She was standing there and it was all in terms of angle of hit. I'd been hit in my, they kept hitting one little nerve in my arm over and over and over, you see. And so I was trying to figure out where it was coming from and it seemed to be coming from just outside and she was standing there just outside. So mm -hmm. she's, she'd been standing there doing this. So here's what I wanted to say. And here's, I think, what many people are standing witness to, not just myself. Um, it's very easy today. It's very easy with the kind of miniaturized RFID tech that's out there, RFID reading tech that's out there, and RFID and RF transmitting tech that's out there. It's very easy for any one of us to become a victim of these so-called anti-personnel technologies, which are really shooting a little pulse of, you know, radar, of radio frequency at you, and that can touch your nerves, you know? And so um, people need to wake up to that. We're living in a society now where the so-called authorities are trying hard to clamp down on any kind of witness testimonial of this nature by calling people mentally ill. So they would like, for instance, to look at the vid this video that we are making currently, and they would like to say these people are highly delusional, they're paranoid, they're mentally ill, they're, they have a persecution complex, they think people are after them. And then they run to the DSM and say, look, paranoia, persecution, you call those people schizoid, you call them schizophrenic, and you take them out of action. Never mind that they're highly educated, never mind that they have 20 years of college teaching experience behind them. We're going to call them schizoid at this point in time because they have a persecution complex and some other complexes. So to combat all of that at this very point, perhaps I should you know, share my screen and show everybody this one document, a couple documents that are very important for people to look at. Um, and this is the United States Air Force Research Lab Biological Effects of Directed Energy document. Um, Viridian Engineering did this contract with the US Air Force, okay? And this is something everybody should know about, the Human Effectiveness Directorate of the Directed Energy Bioeffects Division radio frequency radiation branch. The very fact that these directorates and divisions and branches exist should wake people up. The Air Force and various other bodies of the DOD are indeed testing human effectiveness. In other words, they're trying to figure out how effective these ghastly little weapons are. Okay, so um, you can go, and I'm going to show you where I've put this online, and you can see the entire contract, Biological Effects of Directed Energy. And uh, let me see, I think it was 2002. I could be mistaken the time. Oh, it was. April 1997 to April 2002 was when this, these experiments were performed. And um, here, here are the five areas. Active denial system, also known as vehicle-mounted active denial system. Radio frequency radiation, health and safety. Non-lethal weapon biological effects research. And um, from the newly formed joint, joint non-lethal weapons human effects center of excellence and biotechnology. So if you go in, you're going to find some very alarming information actually. And I'm just going to take you to a couple pages to show you what they have been looking at. One of them, let me go to page number, if I can find it. Uh, 13 is what I wanted. Cancer studies, you know, of course, they're trying to find out how they can induce cancer. Here's what I wanted to show you. Uh, dose symmetry subcontract with Trinity University. They conducted a number of studies aimed at understanding and modeling the effects of <clears throat> MMW on the skin and eyes. The development of the techniques using infrared thermography and data analysis was critical to the success of these efforts, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, they were trying to find out how millimeter wave effects, millimeter wave weapons affect the, the skin and affect the eye, okay? And they were trying to figure out the actual heating rates. And they were comparing the heating rates of human skin and the skin of common lab animals. So, 
actually one thing when you're on this one of the mm. things i would like to throw in there is we are finding more and more people who have these eye implants you know even the book by uh, dr stanninger shows uh, an image of somebody who has an eye implant and it shows up under black light ultraviolet light um mm -hmm. because of the um the crystal lattice on the eye so um one of the, the things i would like to put out there is that for military research would it not be handy to find out how these weapons would be heating the eye maybe when the beam is shot through a wall or two walls or is tested in the field on live moving target now perhaps a way to do that could be implanting people covertly in the eye and then shooting at them through the wall and then this little eye implant would actually send the measurements the data of the heating effect through the chip that's on the back of the head, through the mobile phone network, back to the people who are doing the testing, right? Because so many people are reporting being shot in the eye, and me included, you know? So oh, yes. there's um, this entire book published by a German victim called Peter Kutzer, and um, one of the images that he shows there is actually the damage from shots received to the eye. And I've got images, um, evidence images like that as well, where I photographed that my eye was being shot at so many times that it ended up being totally red, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, they are shooting at eyes. I think all of us have experienced that. And they're shooting with very many different kinds of tech and, uh, you know, at different frequencies and different intensities. Blinding lasers have been outlawed. They've been banned. You know, they've been banned. But I think it seems like they, they're still using different kinds of remote radiation tech to affect eyes. Um, and, and, you know, what's interesting is this particular document also shows that they've been experimenting on animals for a very long time and animals of different kinds, not just rats. You know, you hear about lab rats or guinea pigs. No, they've been experimenting on primates and they are experimenting on humans as well. So they're doing both lab testing and field testing on humans currently. And I say that from my understanding of um, the military research contracts that are currently out there. This this particular document is, is a statement of work related to a US Air Force contract. So, um, you know, uh, and a report really. So I this actually would like to back you up on the topic of animal research. I would like to point people uh, to the fact that um, in, in uh, cartel signaling and otherwise known as double speak, okay, so the criminal crime cartel will use double meanings for words, and you will find a lot, a lot of research articles referring to studies done on primates in the wild. Now, when you're looking at a multi billion dollar industry, there are not that many primates in the wild, sadly, because they're dying out. So I think they mean us. They mean humans. So the, the research that is, you know, claiming field studies on primates in the wild is actually based on human, illegal human research, I would mm -hmm. say. Oh, absolutely. There's so much evidence. If you start looking into it, look at this, for instance, electrophysiology physiology program, ultra wideband RFR studies. Basically, the, the specific question for this project is, can brain or muscle be affected by exposure to ultra wideband radar pulses? Which is really, what are they trying to do? They are trying to send electro stimulus, electrical stimulation across a distance and try to, they're trying to find out how it can affect the tissues, right? So this is all of the evidence for the kind of electromagnetic technologies that people are reporting today. Absolutely, and um, I'm so glad you're, you're bringing up this um, document. We should put the link after the show in the show notes because I would like people to download it and put it straight up into, put it straight into their bundles, you know? Yes, as the bi biological effects, but it also, I think Millicent has another one which is specifically targeted at biological damage done. Uh -huh. I think, you know, we have to put all these, these things together. Yes, yes. And this particular one is this link right here biological effects of directed energy, which is in the JIT press release about the Quincy Public Schools that I released recently. It's in this subsection military non-lethal anti-personnel technologies with bioffex. I aim to do a specific, a separate podcast on this as an info talk, and I'll go over these documents a little bit more in detail, because I want to point to specific points that they bring up. Um, so this is the second document. The, the one that you're talking about, I think, Catherine, is this one, 
Bioeffects are selected non lethal weapons. It's rather famous. Those who are targeted know all about this particular one. It's the Donald Friedman uh, FOIA request. And what it is, is he asked for all documents pertaining to the microwave auditory effect, microwave hearing effect, fray effect, artificial telepathy, anything that causes that kind of effect. And this is what he got. And, um, you know, Millicent had also asked for it. I think she got it in the same year. So here's what it talks about. Different kinds of uh, radiation, laser, radio frequency directed energy, and oral bioeffects. And it's broken up into segments, and you'll see. Microwave heating, it talks about body heating to mimic a fever, which is the nature of the radio frequency incapacitation. I think there are many people reporting victims who are reporting microwave heating currently. There's uh, the disease state, you know. So clearly, we've got doctors working on these experiments for the military who are trying to figure out what the normal state is and the disease state is of the biological organism or what they call the biological target. And they figured out the rates and the intensities, the mechanism to produce the desired effect, how exactly they produce these heating effects with microwaves. And then further down, it talks about, well, this is all about time to onset, duration of effect, et cetera. And as I said, I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Uh, human sensitivities, possible influence on a subject. Uh, so you see, they were, what they're trying to do is, this is all being covered under crowd control technologies, saying we need to heat people up in crowds, give them uncomfortable experiences to make them run away, et cetera. So useful on single persons or crowds, et cetera. And then we can also disrupt their working memories, disorient them, uh, you know, make them literally zombie birds. So these are the kinds of technologies. Again, I'm just moving through this pretty fast. Here's microwave hearing, a phenomenon described by human observers as the sensation of buzzing, ticking, hissing, or knocking sounds that originate within or immediately behind the head. And uh, it can be used to distract individuals. It can be used to communicate with hostages or hostage takers by Morse code or other message systems and so on and so forth so you know this is um and this goes through the entire process over here human sensitivities how to recover possible influence etc and then disruption of neural control so if anyone says to you that to speak out about uh, neurotechnology currently being used to influence brains to transmit emotions to change people's thinking, oh, well, then go look at this document. So it talks about a rhythmic activity synchronization of brain neurons to disrupt normal cortical control of the corticospinal and cortical bulbar pathways, basically to disrupt the normal functioning of the spinal motor neurons, which control muscle contraction and body movements. So people suffering from this condition, now it's not really a condition, it is an assault. It is an attack on their bodies. They lose voluntary control of their body. This synchronization may be accompanied by a sudden loss of consciousness and intense muscle spasms. So here is your non-lethal weapon of today being able to give you intense muscle spasms and remove your consciousness. So, you know, um, I'll just go back and show you again where that is. It's under Military non lethal Anti-Personnel Technologies. It's a PDF. You can download it from my website. And this is everydayconcern.net. I'm, I'm so glad you actually showed all this and, and walked us through this because um, I would say people need to, to quote this sort of stuff in court, you know. And um, when they are reporting these issues, they have to put in a, a quote. Actually, at this point, I would like to put out a community appeal to collect references. Um, and one of the things I would like people um, to send me is um, either a link to a document like this one or the actual PDF of the document like this one. Um, and then please, please pull out um, so that my task of um, putting these references together becomes easier. 
pull out um, a short paragraph or quote from the document um, that you think should be quoted in court or would be really useful to be um, quoted. Um, because most of these documents are, you know, sometimes hundreds of pages long, but there's usually one paragraph or so that is really, you know, one of these things. So I would like to use the, the crowdsource information uh, to actually put these documents together because um, we have to start putting these references in a format where they are actionable, where they can be just used and caught and quoted, you know? So I think we should move towards that. And I think what you have um, put together on your website, Ramola, is just astounding, you know? So many of these documents are already there that lay out everything. And one of the things I wanted to say about these people who are still insisting on, on calling people schizophrenics and all this sort of stuff, there are several arguments which can blow that out of the water. One of them, I would like to share my screen and draw people as attention to one of these arguments that could put a stop to it straight away. And if you go to FAQ, it's at the very top of the FAQ, which is this thing of, uh, you know, is it schizophrenia or paranoia? Okay, this is a standard question. And there's a very, very simple way to blow this out of the water. And that is because schizophrenia and paranoia and this um, comes from the actual medical statistics, affects men, roughly 60% men and roughly 40% women. So this is schizophrenia and paranoia. This is what they look like in the data. Now, when it's human experimentation, you would expect equal numbers of men and women. But when it's sexual violence, you expect something like this. And actually, this is precisely what you get when you look at the statistics of the people reporting secret service crimes and reporting the stuff that usually gets labeled as schizophrenia, as paranoia, 70% of the victims are women. And this, the, um, the uh, quote of the 70%. So this is what the data looks like on the secret service victims. This is what the data looks like on schizophrenia and paranoia as it's diagnosed by these people who might be corrupt um, you know, people anyway. But even with these corrupt psychiatrists around, it looks nothing like the data on the Secret Service victims. And this, um, the actual uh, numbers, right, 70% of the victims are female, comes from Dr. John Hall, who is quoted in this uh, reference here. Okay, so it's this reference that was a publication, you know, by Harlan uh, Gyrard, or however to pronounce his name. Um, okay, so this was, I think, published in, in some local newspaper. And um, then there's also a quote, Dr. John Hall being quoted on the Stopeg and the Ikator sites. And then the actual statistics on schizophrenics being 58% male comes from this link here, okay, which is quoting a scientific publication at the very top. So you can look it up. And this is one way to blow it out of the water, okay? So this is end of story. When you've got large statistics, it's clear they can they can talk until they're blue in the face. It cannot be schizophrenia or paranoia because the victim profiles, the sex ratio doesn't match. A second way to blow this out of the water for good is a bit more sophisticated, but just as simple at core, which is to say, if you are claiming, as the pseudoscientific field of psychiatry has been doing for decades, that hearing voices is a mental illness that is brought about by some sort of disease or chemical imbalance in the brain, I have to tell you that uh, systems analysis and basic physics tell you that this is all bollocks. And that's because if you have a chemical imbalance or if you have any sort of disease, the complex human or the complex system that you're dealing with, that is the human brain and its auditory system and its brain, if you have a random disturbance that is a disease or something else, it cannot, it cannot physically produce this complex effect of voices talking with perfect grammar in full sentences and telling you stuff that sounds amazingly like racism and misogyny. All right, because those are very complex structures. If you just have a random disturbance in the brain, like from a chemical imbalance or whatever, you cannot produce. You know, what you would expect is maybe noise or maybe you can't hear very well or you hear odd noisy bits or maybe weird noise sounding things, perhaps, if at all. But no way can a random disturbance sound like a full perfect sentence with English grammar. It just cannot. You can't match up the two things. So the only way to bring about the hearing of voices 
is through a chip in your ear and some dickhead on the other side talking into a microphone. Sorry to use this language, but that's basically it. And this is what has been happening all these decades. And meanwhile, we've got these armies of weaponized morons called psychiatrists who can't figure out the simple thing that when you have a disturbance, you can't create a complex effect like that. It's impossible. And further, there are so many technologies today to put voices into people's heads. I mean, we saw what you're talking about is ab actually absolutely possible. Any one of us can understand that, right? A little chip that has a little microphone built in, yes. And speakers built in, yes. That's certainly one technology. There's also what we just read about in that document, you know, microwave hearing, which can be used to send messages to hostages in hostage situations. How exactly do you send messages, you know? So microwave hearing is one of them. Voice to skull devices. Voice to skull is a voice technology that the army actually disclosed in public online and then quickly scrambled to pull the definitions down when it became you know, aware, when it became a, a, a kind of absolute public knowledge issue, people became aware that the army has this technology and started to say that voices are connected possibly to this tech. That's when the army was scrambled and pulled that definition down. Why? Because there is indeed a massive move afoot to keep these, keep these neurotechnologies secret. They are trying desperately to keep these neurotechnologies secret. They're using them in their anti-personnel crowd control technologies. They're using them for experimentation. They're using them, I would contend, also for nothing but satanic ritual abuse. And as you say, Catherine, for sexual abuse, for sexual sadism. You know, there are pornographic and torture associations over here. There are gratuitous associations over here. And I'm going to be writing about this as well, because this is another misuse of these dirty remote radiation weaponries that we need to be looking at today. You know, we need to understand that there is that possibility. There are freaks in our midst. There are psychopaths. There are sociopaths. There are just plain cooks in our midst who want to use this kind of tech to torture women and to torture men as well and to torture children. And guess what? If this tech exists, if this possibility exists, if human nature, you know, being what it is, Shouldn't we as a human society, a humanity, rise up and say, this is rather scary tech. This is rather dangerous tech. I don't think people should be having access to it, you know, which is what the whole World Treaty Conference to ban these tech um, technologies is all about. Um, so, you know, there's so many technologies today. My point really is today when there are when all of these tech technologies do exist to put, to put voices in people's heads. How on earth can these psychiatrists, how on earth can the entire body of psychiatry and psychology, by the way, how on earth can the APA, the American Psychologist Association, and the APA Psychiatric, the American Psychiatrist Association, and you know the European counterparts as well, how on earth can they get away with daring to diagnose anybody as schizophrenic when these technologies exist today and when there is increasing evidence that these technologies are being used by dark military bodies? you know, in experimentation programs and also in operation programs. How can psychiatrists not get educated about these technologies? The answer I think is related to media, media being owned by the cartel, by the organized crime syndicates that we're talking about here. Media is in their hands and media is publishing popcorn. You know, this is my term for it and I continue to use it, use it. It's because it's just kind of useful. It's a sigh of propaganda pieces by con artists. You know, these are cons being pulled off on us, on humanity, by media mavens who are nothing but agents working for the agencies and putting out government propaganda. And this is this in itself is a crime against humanity because it um, withholds true information from the public. And it puts out lies and it denies, dismisses and discredits all of the reporting victims who are coming forward to speak out bravely and courageously about this technology being used on them. And these people who should be celebrated as our heroes, you know, are now being maligned, discredited, put down as schizoid, put down as paranoid. It's outrageous. This is why. If there are any ethical psychologists out there listening to this, 
any ethical psychiatrist, you guys need to get get your act together. You need to shape up. You need to figure out what on earth the, the military tech is currently. We are putting this information out. We're not the only ones. There are other activists. There are other you know, journalists putting this information out. You psychiatrists and psychologists need to shape up get educated, get informed about the horrific nature of these electromagnetic and neurotechnologies currently being used in humans today. And you need to start, start speaking out and you need to start protecting the reporting victims of these crimes against humanity on whom these technologies are being used. Well, another thing is that they are totally ignoring the quote unquote school shooters and airport shooters and people like that who, as far as I can tell, up to a certain point in their life, never had one iota of psychological problem until a recent time period. I mean, it might take them a few weeks or a few months to drive somebody to do a mass shooting, but they seem to be singled out and then pounced upon and then worked on, worked on, worked on, worked on until they're forced into a mass shooting. And yet, how many people have committed such a, an atrocity without some, I mean, in past, you know, uh, decades, um, without some past um, evidence that there was something wrong with the child to begin with? You know, I mean, when I was uh, living in, in Arizona there, and on an Air Force base, um, we had outdoor cats. You know, everybody had outdoor cats. Well, people started to go through the neighborhood and strangle the cats and just leave them for people. Well, that was a mentally ill two boys who are about 12 years old, you know. I mean, people start doing bizarre things when they're young. They don't wait till they're 30, 40, 50, 60 to suddenly go crazy. I mean, psychologists and psychiatrists know this, and yet it's never mentioned. Nobody ever questions, well, why did this 17-year-old do this? Or why did this 30-year-old do this? Or this 40-year-old do this with no past history of any type of psychological problems and no family history of any kind of psychological problems? Yet they, they yell about school bullying, school bullying, school bullying. But they take somebody and they, as far as I can tell from other, t uh, other targeted people, their children are being targeted in the schools as well for severe abuse. Well, you can take it a little bit better at 30, 40, 50 than you can at 12. You know, so these children are being driven, driven, driven. And I think they, they take a few and then see who, turn, who they can turn into mass shooters. You know, you give them opportunity, you give them voice to skull, but the psychologists and psychiatrists aren't mentioning a word about things that don't fit these scenarios. And they are letting children have their lives destroyed. I mean, look at the Parkville shooter. He's gone. You know, he's gone forever. He'll never get out of prison. Was that something he intended? Or was he bullied, 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 and then told by voice to skull, your only option is to do this, or it'll never end? How many of these people were told this? You know, um, the airport shooter, these other people, how many were driven, driven, driven? I mean, Myron May is a perfect example. This was a very nice, um, well-educated, professional man who begged, begged, begged for help and got none. None. And he said, I, I don't even want to do this, but I'm left with nothing, you know, or this continues. And it, it destroyed his, his uh, quality of life in his early 30s, it looks like. You know, so they are betraying the society and individuals by not putting these puzzle pieces together, you know, and saying, wait a minute, this, this, um, this bullying is over the top um, and V2K on top of it. And let's see now, we're getting reports that the FBI basically is fully engaged in COINTELPRO and that the FBI has political aspirations that would include disarming the entire country so that their masters could do much more of what they want to do at whim that is outside the Constitution. So the FBI pretty much have turned into Gestapo, you know, and they would appear to be behind a lot of this, facilitating it and then making sure that the people don't get help, don't get taken off that path that they're driving them down, you know. So it's, it's horrific. They are basically making people sacrificial lambs. The people who are being shot, 
and the people who are doing the shooting who may never have done anything like that in their lives had they not been massively targeted and bullied and hit with um, electromagnetic and other types of technologies. You know, they could have left, they could have led perfectly normal, happy lives, never hurting another person, but now their lives are destroyed as well as, as their victims, so-called victims, but they're all victims, you know? And that's the immense power these, these technologies give, whoever is using them, you know? And, and that's, uh, that's the situation that we're in today, that literally whoever has access to these technologies can start influencing, manipulating, and destroying children's lives, youth, the lives of youth, of young people, and the lives of, you know, everybody in society. Exactly as you have spelled it out, Karen, the fact that mass shooters could be cultivated from very young, or they could be suddenly made mass shooters, you know, in their 20s and 30s or whatever, through the use of these technologies, through using voice to skull constantly, constant abuse, constant misdirection, because that's what it is, right? Sadistic misdirection. Go off and shoot somebody, and that's the only way you can be safe and save people, um, and so on. And, you know, duping people, deceiving people, as well as making their lives so tormented with the use of directed energy weapons in their bodies. Because literally, that's what people are reporting today, absolute torture with these weapons, absolute bodily torture, you know, symptoms of torture. So, so what the CIA is doing in these black sites, you know, physically speaking, that people are now writing about and reading about, um, can be achieved and is being achieved as per the reports of reporting victims, uh, through the use of electromagnetic technologies. So that is an immense and extreme and of evil power. And as you connected so avidly, Karen, with the FBI, with these little false flag ops that are being set up everywhere, and with that political agenda of disarming the populace. And then at the same time, we've got the technocrats running transhumanizing ops on the rest of us, or, sorry, on all of us with the nanotech and the aerosols, et cetera, plans for robotizing, plans for zombification. These are no longer science fiction. These are no longer, you know, fabu uh, fantasies and uh, speculation and conjecture. These can be very closely tied to the documentation that we actually already have on how these electromagnetic technologies can be used and are being used today. I mean, it's, it's shameful that the, the uh, journalists aren't connecting the dots and they're purposely not connecting the dots, you know. And the founding fathers basically say <clears throat> they knew that the survival of the American democracy or constitutional um, <clears throat> republic depended on a free and honest journalism throughout the country. And we don't have that. And I think the termino terminology of prostitute for somebody who basically is told what to tell the people to think is what has replaced, you know, so many in mainstream media. And they're just sellouts. You know, they might as well be all Tokyo Roses, you know, because they're working to undermine the American public. They're telling things, you know, that are opposite of what is true. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they're just, again, they're deflecting. Look over there. Just don't look over there because then you'll see what's really going on. You know, so it really is shameful. And I do praise you and, and the other journalists who have had the guts to stand up and say, no, I'm, I'm telling the truth. Because if I don't tell the truth, it will be too late. I mean, we're on the hair of it being too late. But uh, I think we can still pull it back. Uh, people have just got to listen, open their minds, and circumvent this this cognizant dissonance where it says, well, if I believe this, then I have to get off my butt and do something. Yeah, you do. You know, the founding fathers pledged to each other their lives and their fortunes. Okay, many of them not only lost their lives, but they lost um, vast fortunes that they had worked very hard for. And they knew that that was at risk. And they knew they put their families at risk. They had wives and children, and they knew they were risking the future of their wives and their children, but they considered the wives and children of the entire country, you know, as well as their own. And I'm sure there was some kind of discussion in the family it says, that said, you know, we're basically um, 
endangering the family as being traitors to the British monarchy if we engage in the American Revolution, but we've got to. We've got to or we don't have a life, we don't have a country. And so that's the decision they made. And unfortunately, the mainstream media basically said, what's easy? What's going to give me a lot of money? What's going to give me a lot of comfort? You know, um, What's going to give me prestige as a... Um, uh, apple of the eye of the master, you know, and that's the road they've chosen, you know, to tell the pretty little lies, you know, while the people are eaten up, you know, while the people are gobbled up and there is no more freedom, only the facade, only facade uh, remains. And these are your freedoms, and if you use them, we'll destroy you. That's the message being sent. And I think media have been told not to cover certain subjects, that certain subjects are taboo. And you have these so-called journalists who are paid by these media, you know, the other ones with the cushy jobs and the fat paychecks and who are absolutely compliant and who, as you say, will not think for themselves, will not take a stand, will not think critically, will not step out. Because I would imagine by now, if there are any real journalists with any real brains in any of these media outlets, examining the situation, looking at the documentation, I think they would have to understand the truth of what is going on, you know, which is what we are reporting. So um, the fact that you have journalists being silent today, I don't think the situation is going to last for long. I think we're soon going to be seeing a mass of people starting to come out and starting to report on this. Um, you know, Susie Dawson recently on Twitter, she actually put out a bunch of tweets stating precisely this, that the use of directed energy weapons and electromagnetic technologies on targets is soon going to become an issue people are going to have to start reporting on it. And she predicted that 2018 will be the year that it's going to come out into the open. And she also spoke out and spoke to journalists saying, you know, people up to this point have been too scared to speak out. And you see politicians are scared to speak out. Senators are scared to speak out. Journalists are scared, scared to speak out about this. Everybody's so worried they'll be targeted by these deadly weapons, which are going to assault their bodies. You know, these are assaults at the level of the human body and the human brain. Because of fear, certain people have stayed silent. And as you say, Karen, to those people, that's what we should say. If you want to save this country, because this country and the whole world, really every single country on the, on the planet, is literally on the verge of disappearing into the abyss run by criminals, corrupt criminals engaging in satanic ritual abuse and child abuse and child sacrifice. The entire world, the entire world of humanity is in danger of being drowned out by criminality. If people do not have the guts, the spine, to stand up and make a stand today and start speaking out about the truth of what's going on, you know, about the actual nature of these technologies and the fact that they are being used on people. Yeah, and I also think that when we were um, asking questions about uh, the media, we know that the media were affected by Operation Mockingbird with the actual active planting of agents, intel agents in the media. Um, I think equivalent projects have been happening and uh, the, the equivalence of Operation Mockingbird um, for hospitals and all other fields as well, especially psychiatry. So I'm not sure what those projects were called, you know, project, I don't know what, Flying Eagle or whatever the hell, but um, there have been active drives to put intel agents into psychiatry. These people are first and foremost, in, well, actually they're first and foremost criminals. Secondly, they are, you know, intel agents, and thirdly, they're masquerading as psychiatrists. And I have managed to, uh, you know, uncover some. Some were involved in the entrapment of Melanie and the kidnap of her baby. They were acting like intel agents. They were not acting like medical doctors. Um, and I think this has happened behind our backs, just like Operation Mockingbird has taken over the entire media landscape, you know, for the cartel. The same thing must have happened in psychiatry, but also in medicine. And I think this is how it can be explained that major hospitals, especially as it seems university hospitals and research hospitals seem to be entirely captured by intel agencies and the military industrial complex. You know, and I think we'll discover 
the the equivalence of Operation Mockingbird in the um, in the documents. Maybe if we're alive in thirty years' time, you know. But I think we already can see evidence now, and we have to move to a model. So the criminality is so bad that we have to use scientific methods to uncover what is going on before the classification period expires. This is what we have to be doing, you know? And thankfully, this is exactly what science is for because nature is essentially classifying, right? It's classifying the physical processes, the physical laws, and science is all about uncovering processes and methods and, and uh, certain connections when you're not told the answer, you know, in the documents. So I think we have to move to a world where we are uncovering all these things by scientific methods. And um, I, I was in the background, I was trying to look up um, the link where people have already mapped the entire media landscape in the US, in Britain, and I think also Switzerland. And it's called the Swiss Institute, uh, the Swiss Anti-Corruption Institute or something. I tweeted out the link a long time ago and I couldn't find it. But what they did is they um, took the major newspapers, looked at who's running it, and showed how these people are all connected. They are connected to things like the Council on Foreign Relations and so on. And the people who are sitting on one are also sitting on the other, you know, and uh, that is the operation of the cartel. So, you know, we can forget about media and we can forget about these things, but we now, now that we, an institute has done it for media, we have to do the same thing for all the hospitals and so-called medical health boards and so on, you know, and I know that there's lots of exciting investigations already happening in the, um, in the group that we'll be hearing lots about, but I encourage also other people to, to still keep doing that. Um, I have two very short things to say, just very, very short things um, uh, to announce. Uh, last week, I said that I'm going to be talking about the death of Stephen Rawlings at Oxford. He was a professor at the University of Oxford in the Department of Physics. I was at the Department of Physics. And I said that I'm going to uh, say, so, sorry, let me uh, share my screen so that I can already get this out in case I'm being, you know, pushed under a bus before I can talk about this. It's this man, Stephen Rawlings, okay? He was, um, well, he was a, an astronomer. Most crucially, I think he was the uh, the lead scientist in a radio astronomy project. And um, here, for example, it's already called the mystery uh, death. So mystery surrounds the death of Oxford astrophysicist. This is Physics World. This is our physics newspaper here. This is the scientist. Um, what I would like to say is that I'm, I'm going to be talking about his death a bit uh, further, but I ask people to investigate some more for next week. Um, so Stephen Rawlings, I would say, was murdered. I think he was murdered with directed energy weapons. I think that the, the man in whose presence he died had nothing to do with it. And I've got some inside information on it, but I would like to encourage the community to dig around and find out what Stephen Rawlings was working on. I don't know because I'm a particle physicist. He's an astrophysicist and I had no insight into what he was working on. But when I found out that he was a radio astronomer, um, I thought, hang on, could it be that he might, a radio astronomy is very sensitive to radio signals and could it have been the case that he might have cottoned on to something I don't know, harp <laughs> or something harp related or electromagnetic uh, weapons related. But also remember that radio astronomy sites exclude all mobile phones, right? Because the signals are also interfering. So could odd micro, uh, not microphone, odd mobile phone signals or maybe signals related to human body chips being perhaps covertly implanted in scientists who are then walking onto the radio astronomy sites without their mobile phones, perhaps still emitting signals perhaps cause some sort of background that might be picked up by lead scientists like Stephen Rawlinson and so on. So um, please, please, please investigate it. I'm 100% sure he was murdered. And the short reason why I think he was murdered is because um, he had um, a psychotic or bipolar or schizophrenic, whatever, mental health episode. But the mental health episode was randomly triggered when his wife departed to America on a family visit, okay? So this guy had a mental health episode in the past. He was taking drugs to control his condition, but you know, he's a, an Oxford professor. He knows how to take drugs. And then exactly when his spouse is on another continent, he has a mental health episode in Oxford 
a very close friend called Davinda Sivia, who um, is a, a scientist and a professor at Oxford, um, uh, was knew him very well and he noticed that he was feeling unwell and he was actually trying to take care of his best friend, right, and had him around at his home. And when uh, Stephen Rawlings was at Davinda Sivia's home, uh, Stephen Rawlings had a massive aggressive, okay, also warning, warning, neurotech warning. He suddenly became physically violent against a Davinda Sivia, who was his best friend for decades. These two people were very close. And then Davinda Sivia was trying to, um, you know, basically protect himself and trying to hold down Stephen Rawlings um, by his own testimony. And as he held down Stephen Rawlings, um, this guy died. And at first people thought it was asphyxiation, but then it turned out that it was um, a heart attack or something like that. Now, statistically, these things are, have a certain probability, but the compound probability of all of these things happening together are a bit too rare for them to be plausible. So I would like to put out that my personal hypothesis, having discarded the official version, is that um, Intel, attacked Stephen Rawlings or the crime cartel Stephen Rawlings when his wife departed to the US so that he didn't have his spouse nearby to take care of him. They set off a mental health episode as a plausible deniability thing. And um, then, you know, when uh, Devinda Sivia was trying to take care of his best friend, they triggered an aggressive episode as a cover story and then basically gave Stephen Rawlings a heart attack through a direct energy weapon or perhaps a chip in, chip in his heart or heck knows. But I would say Intel triggered this. Um, now, the personal information I have on that is that I spoke to Devinda Sivia because he was a fellow at St. Is I think still is a fellow at St. John's College. But I was uh, at the same time at St. John's. We, you know, talked regularly. We, we were friends, and you know, and um, he told me about this whole thing. He was extremely upset because basically his best friend died in his arms. Um, but Devinda was very open. He immediately emailed um, Stephen Rawlings' wife, you know, when the police arrived and so on and said, I'm really sorry. I, it looks like I've, I've killed my best friend. But I don't think Devinda killed his best friend because all the other circumstances do not add up. But it adds up 100% with a targeted killing by Intel to cover up something that I suspect has something to do with radio astronomy. And um, the links are not aliens. Please don't go down the alien path. I think the link is something to do with 5G, mobile phones, human body chips, neurotech, or harp, or this sort of stuff. So please, please, please get on the case now, you know? So that's um, one announcement, sorry. I was just going to make a comment about, you know, remote heart attacks, the remote heart attack weapon. Again, you know, holistic doctors have been dying by the dozen, um, you know, if not by more numbers and uh, people are being killed remotely in their 40s, 30s, 50s, 60s. This is not normal. You know, this is all connected to, I think, and this is where we have to bring in other issues uh, currently facing us today in humanity. And that's Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, which is again, the transhumanist agenda, the humanity takeover agenda, the genocide agenda, the depopulation agenda. So there's a lot of extremely grievous crime occurring on a large scale in so many factors among sectors of our society. So, you know, everything, is unfortunately connected and as you say it is something to explore and investigate catherine i'm looking at the time we kind of have to close for today so I, maybe you guys want to i, I do any like last to... thoughts or whatever one last line and i should have said it at the beginning but it wasn't online so one of the things i would like to say i'm going to tweet it out but please maybe help me spread the word because i didn't say it at the beginning of techno i finished the draft okay people this is a draft and i'm writing comments of the short version of the affidavit template okay so the idea is that i would like to start um doing exactly this sort of um you know statistical and, and scientific investigation into what's going on and i'm inviting comments from the community i will be putting out an explanatory video later on but i would like to already invite people if i may just share my screen um please go to my website okay so i'll show you how to get here okay so if you go to stop 007 okay there will be a link here at the top later on um just after the show but at the moment you have to scroll down to oh here burning down the house of crime this one where the campaigns are 
And the first link, Affidavit Collection, if you click on that, the very top is now the draft of the short version of the affidavit. If you click here on this thing, okay, this is the draft, and um, I will be releasing the final version on Sunday. This is the final orders call, okay, but it has the draft here and in the foot and the footer. So please don't start filling this out for real, but please do download it and uh, maybe um, print it off and scribble around on it because when you start filling it out as a first draft, that's when you maybe notice mistakes or what's missing or what's um, you know uh, what uh, should be added in. The way I would like to do this affidavit collection is as follows. Um, for court use, if I want to use it as supporting evidence for court cases, it has to be authenticated. So ideally, I would like to have, um, in Europe, you need a passport, a copy of the passport. So I'm everybody who fills it in and sends it to the JIT, I ask you to include a copy of your passport. But I ask you to cover up the serial number. I don't think we need that, okay? So please cover up it, um, the serial number, but I need a photo ID to confirm your address, your signature, and your face if you are submitting this for court, okay? Um, and I'll be writing instructions, but you don't even need to submit it to me. You can use this as a template for your own affidavit collection privately from people you trust, okay? So this is a service to the community. But one of the things I would like to do is I would like to release this as a part that is private. So the first page is private information, not for publication. But the main part of the affidavit, this is the start of the public part of the affidavit, is totally anonymous. And most of the um, the survey is just tick boxes where I'm asking what type of off offense occurred, okay? This bit is, um, this field is when did it start, but just very roughly month and year, if you know that. And then it's just a tick box exercise of how often are you suffering this offense and um, do you have evidence, yes, no. And if you have evidence, just put a tick there. Okay, so this is a very long survey. And at the very, very end, I'm just gonna scroll through um, the last bit that it has at the very end. It's just a diagram where you can show which parts of your body are either chipped or being very heavily attacked. Okay, so there are two versions of this. And I'll show you how to fill this out digitally so that it's neat, alternatively print it off and draw it on. And then the very last page here um, that's not to be published is the statement of truth with your signature and then notarized. Okay, that's it. And I'm hoping that this quick tick box exercise will help many, many more people come forward. And the entire idea is that it has, I think, almost 70 sections. And I was shocked to discover that I can personally put a tick in almost every section. And every one of these 70 aspects, including, you know, break-ins, car sabotage, dew attacks, chipping, whatever you want to name, right, is different aspects of this crime. And this all-out warfare attack seems to... Yeah, a tech victim likes me, like me in every single aspect. So if you put a tick in one of these boxes visually, you know, I can already show the judges, oh my God, something really major is happening to all these victims, you know? And the, the step of having it notarized and putting your signature makes it actionable in court. You know, the court has to, it's like carved into stone. They have to take you seriously, you know? That's the idea. But I'll put out an instructional video, but this is still just a draft. So please, between now and Sunday, Everyone, maybe download it, peruse it, and give me all your comments. Send it to contact at stop007.org. So contact at stop007.org. And give me your comments because the final draft on Sunday, that, that will be it. And I think most people will be filling out the short affidavit survey, not even the long one. So whatever you would like proved in court to support your own case, please get it in now, okay? If any, any aspect of the crimes against you are missing, in this affidavit template, please email it to me and tell me about it. But I'll tweet it out and I'll put a, out a video later on tonight. So um, that's it from me. Well, I don't have anything of my own to, to add, except I wanted to thank Catherine for this phenomenal piece of work. And I would like to remind people that it is well worth your time to download the, um, the, uh, the document go through it and fill it out. I mean, you may look at it and go, oh, this is a lot of work. I've got evidence, why do I need to do this? You need to do it because the evidence, a lot of the evidence people send me and they say, this is evidence of X, Y, Z. 
okay? They send me a photograph, and it may or it may not. If you're going to show a judge this and say, you know, I was sitting in my living room, and uh, an invisible ray of something came and bruised my arm, he may not believe you at all, because all he sees is a picture of a bruised arm. You could have bruised your arm walking past a door that you bumped into. So that's proof that you have a bruise, but it's not proof how you got it. But if you take this, this um, document and you fill it out, and then you can show a judge that, you know, 15, 20, 100 other people that you don't know have gone through very similar experiences, then he starts to get the idea, this is a pattern, this is a program, it's being done to them. So you may think you have evidence, and then you may come up short. So you need to bolster your evidence with the evidence of other people. And there may be 10 other people in the group that you choose that have really rock solid evidence and very possibly you could ride their coattails. So don't dismiss this, this document, it's very important. And thank you again, Catherine, That's, it's invaluable. It really is. Well, thank you for, for supporting that um, this entire endeavor. I'm, I'm also, I apologize to the community that it took me so long because it was meant to be finished, I mean, half a year ago in October. And um, when I'm shocked, and, and it shows the intensity of targeting, when I look back and it, I realize how it took me six months to get this out, you know. But I'm, I'm, one of the things I would like to say to the community, I really thought about this, and there's a, there's a method in the madness, <laughs> okay. So I'm going somewhere with this. And it's exactly, um, as you say, it's trying to help people whose evidence is maybe not rock solid, because at the end of the day, we have to prove something that is classified military technology. So none of us will have the perfect evidence. You know, we can't have. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, this is basically why I'm trying to cross validate many, many cases. And, and this is also what the notarization is for. And I know it's a pain in the neck to do it, but that, that is the step that, um, that gives it court validity. A court cannot discard a notarized affidavit where you say that under the pains of perjury or whatever the, the phrase is, right? Um, you are saying that this is the truth. And when totally unconnected people are saying this, it has to be taken seriously. And um, another thing I would like to say is if you're scared filling this out because you think um, you might be attacked further, there's a section in the affidavit where you can actually note down that while you were writing this affidavit, you were either threatened through voice to skull or you were actually physically attacked with directed energy weapons as retaliatory retaliatory action because that is also further evidence so there's there's if they get back at you there's a way to get back at them for getting back at you if you know what i mean that mechanism has already been put in <laughs> that's great catherine and frankly you know our intelligence our in intention and our willpower is what really helps us get back against those who are getting back at us because a lot of retaliation is going on currently as I think each of us is experiencing. So I have to thank you as well for this incredible effort that you've made over so many months and you know, thank you for sticking with it. Despite the fact that you've been hit so badly, we all know you've been hit very badly and you know, thanks for sticking with it. It's very important as Karen says, um, you know, and I back up as well to put this in a format that it can be presented in the court of law and to actually push through with these lawsuits because whatever happens with these lawsuits, so it's even if they try to throw them out, etc., saying national security, you know, the government won't get involved in cases like this, blah, blah, etc., whatever. Um, the fact is that a lawsuit becomes a record, it becomes public record. And uh, that's part of what we're about as well. We're trying to inform the public, we're trying to establish public record for history. We're trying to establish historic and archival and documentary record. And these, all of these steps are very, very important. So on that note, um, you know, I'll have to bid everybody farewell. I have to take off. So um, if you guys are absolutely done, uh, we can wish everybody a good morning. And, um, you know, just say we'll come back next week and uh, we'll have more to report, I think, as well. So thanks, everyone, for watching and see you next week. Bye-bye.